Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Breaking Red, Designing IOCs Using Red Team Tools. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Joe Vest, SANS course author. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Joe. Thank you, Carol, and thank you for everyone attending. Let's get started. Today, we're going to be speaking a continuous series of Breaking Red, this time with the topic of designing IOCs with Red Team tools. We are going to take a step back and continue discussing red teaming in details. Red team is still new to many people, and we need a common foundation from this. So we're going to quickly dive into the definition of red teaming, why someone would red team, and compare and co contrast to other security types, specifically penetration testing, as this is the most common question I get with red teaming. What is the difference between red teaming and penetration testing? We'll quickly take a step into, into that before we move into our IOC discussion. Finally, we'll talk about IOCs and their roles in red teaming, which is the core of what we're discussing today. We'll conclude today with a quick discussion on the new SANS red teaming course. In order to have an um, understanding of red teaming, we need a common definition. So let's walk through this definition here. Red teaming is the process of using tactics, techniques, and procedures known as TTPs, sometimes called tradecraft, to emulate a threat with a goal. Goal is very important here. Red teaming is very goal and scenario driven. The goals of training and measuring the effectiveness of people, processes, and technology used to defend a network. What does this mean? This means red teaming is about using threat tactics with the goal of training and measuring security operations as a whole. That is the core of red teaming. It's focusing on security and understanding security as a whole, not necessarily directly focusing on vulnerabilities and exploits, for, say, for instance. During our discussions of red teaming, there's a list of jargon and terms that we commonly use. These might be used in other areas, but I want to focus on a few for today's conversation. C, command and control, or C2. Command and control is the influence an attacker has over a compromised computer system. In other words, this is how they influence and issue commands and have a resource perform actions on their behalf. Often this is thought of as something, say, Metasploit's Meterpreter, having a shell on a remote box. But command and control is much, much more than that. It is all the components that make up the influence over that target. It is tools. It is protocols. It is intent. It is persistence. All of the pieces and parts that make up communications and influence over a target is command and control. IOC, the, uh, this is today's topic. IOC, or indicator of compromise, these are just merely the artifacts left behind as a threat moves through a network. If you work in the forensics world, this is probably a common term that you use or hear, where you're breaking down or you're analyzing a, a malware, for instance, and looking at its indicators, characterizing it. Well, indicators in this case can be something such as changes to the network, new files placed on disk, modifications to system configuration. It can also be events, alerts, logs, information that's left behind from various security devices. All of the steps that an adversary will take and when they're moving through a network leaves behind some sort of traits. We're going to focus on some of these today. And finally, TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, also sometimes called tradecraft, this is the how 
of threat operators. This is what they're doing. We're going to get into some threat profiles, and these directly affect and drive threat tradecraft. Quickly, let's talk about why you would red team. Why would you do this? Why would you have a bad guy attack my network? Well, these three bullets here really drive home the benefits and the reasons why red, team, red teaming exists. It's used to measure effectiveness of security operations as a whole. One of the best reasons to use red teaming. Because it's not focused on specific exploits, vulnerabilities, you're really looking at security operations as a whole. A great deal of time, money, energy is spent on security defenses, staff, expensive tools, time, all of these things go into making up security operations defenses. A red team can challenge those and, and determine where they really fall, what works, what does not work. Do procedures work? Are your staff trained and understand how to use the tools that you've spent money on to use for defense? This is where red teams really come into play. Training and measuring blue teams. This is one of the most important pieces of red teaming. Red teams exist to train blue. You can argue that that is their sole goal. Blue teams need time for practice and training. Although classes are great, eventually you need to face a real threat. And a red team can offer a safe threat to attack and emulate a real bad guy so that blue teams can practice their procedures practice and train on their tools, learn new techniques and concepts. It is a really, really good for blue teams to go against a red team versus a real threat. The red team will help them improve and get better so that when they attack or attack from a real threat, they'll be ready. And finally, red teams are really good at understanding specific threats or scenarios. For, for, uh, for instance, wanna cry, and ransomware introduced a lot of zero days on the Windows side and a lot of ransomware that people were facing faced with. Well, a red team can take a scenario of a generic, of a sort of generic Windows zero day, tie that into some ransomware, and use a scenario to attack a network. The blue teams can look and see how their tools and techniques and processes, their own TTPs, stand up against this and use red teaming's capability and understanding of creating attack scenarios to help them train and be better. And what does this really mean? This really means threat gets a vote. When defense is, is building and designing their tools, procedures, all of their own defensive TTPs, having threat at the table to get a vote on what is or is not done is really important. That's what red teams do. They allow threat to have a vote on how security should be implemented. It gives the blue team much better information about what a threat would or would not do. Red teaming versus other tests. I'll quickly run through this. I'm gonna focus on penetration testing because it is the number one question that I get. Vulnerability assessments, very wide, very narrow, typically, you're looking at broad range of discovery of vulnerabilities, looking at systems, as many systems as you can across an organization. All of the findings that come from a vulnerability assessment are simply that, just vulnerabilities. They're all tied, not operationally, but individually to each system. So the risks that you have are difficult to measure those to an organizational level. You move into pen testing, penetration testing, is deeper than that. It's still vulnerability focused, but this time you're focusing to measure exploitation, risk of exploitation. Often in a penetration test, for instance, you're looking for, let's say an external pen test, identify all the ways a bad guy could get into a network. You're looking at, say there's 10 different ways for a bad guy to get into a network. Penetration test will identify and find those and learn the risks of exploitation for gaining access to a network. On a red team, in the same context, a red team might use one of those techniques. 
and they would never discover anything else. That one exploit is just a means to the end to move to the next step to ultimately achieve the red team goal, which is typically operational impact of some sort. Hitting a, an organization at their heart, going after their crown jewels. And that is really where red team is, is, um, comes into play. Red teaming versus pen testing. So bottom line, penetration testing is a simulated attack against the system with the goal of measuring risks of exploitation. Operational risks sometimes can be inferred, but they're not typically the direct target to understand security operation, security operational risk as a whole. On the other side, red teams emulate a threat with the goal of training or measuring the security operations as a whole. In other words, looking at operational risks overall. Penetration tests typically will identify more flaws and exploits. Red teaming does not. Red teaming will do what's needed to achieve those goals. So sometimes exploits and risks are not identified during a red team engagement. But you do get a concept in, a, in the context of understanding risks associated with security operations as a whole. So bottom line for red teaming, vulnerabilities and exploits may be used, but they're merely a means to an end. Operational impacts are where the focus is on red team engagements. Understanding security operations as a whole is where the value of red teaming comes in play. In addition, training. Training of blue teams using red team's threat tactics is very, very useful in allowing blue teams to become better and more prepared against a real threat. Let's shift into the IOC discussion. IOC usage and red, role in red teaming. So today we're talking about IOCs and using red team tools to generate and create those. We'll specifically be looking at three different tools. We'll use Cobalt Stripe, PowerShell, and a binary metadata modification tool. Three simple tools that we'll use to generate and create our threat profile with specific indicators of compromise. What are these usage of this IOC? It really becomes the way you describe a threat actor and how they operate. The way we will work through this is we will work in reverse. We will create our IOCs, create how we want to look and feel in an environment, and then use the tools to build the necessary components that allows us to do this so that when we live in that network, we live in it from a red team's perspective in a controlled manner. We understand what indicators will be left behind, what they look like. We are maintaining positive control over the trace elements that we leave behind. All of our breadcrumbs are controlled by us. That is what a strong professional red team does. They understand what indicators they leave. With that said, these indicators, when you create these, are not necessarily, and they should not be interpreted directly verbatim by the blue team. Just because a red team creates a specific threat, certain binaries, they have certain persistence mechanisms, does not mean they're not dynamic in nature. They can be. Sometimes a red team likes to be static because it can tell certain characteristics of a blue team's defense. Sometimes a red team might need to be more dynamic and fluid. Even in those times when they're making modifications, they're still tracking and understanding all of their actions. So. For instance, if a blue team learns that a red team places a file in a certain location, that is not what the focus is. The red team can use this information to understand how blue responds and reacts to the scenario that they're playing on. And a threat goes through three phases. Typical red team engagement, so there's three phases. You get into a network. This is typically associated with the exploitation phase. How do you gain access to the resources you need to ultimately achieve your goal? That's typically the exploitation phase. You have the stay-in phase. This is where you live and operate. This is, most of the operations occur in this phase. Command and control is established and maintained. Persistence is here and lateral movement. Everything that takes for a threat to live and breathe and exist inside a network occurs in the stay-in phase. This is what is allowed to prep 
for whatever operational impact they would like to do, which gets into the act phase. Today, we're focusing on this stay-in phase. This is where the bulk of our indicators come from. During threat planning, before we can even talk about indicators, it is extremely helpful to create a threat profile. Now, this is a threat profile is an overall characterization of a threat. What does it look like? What's their goals? What do they need to look and feel like? What level? Are they a simple threat? Are they an advanced threat? Going through this threat profile creation process is covered much more in our 564 course, but here we're going to look at it quickly and focus just on the indicator section. This particular threat profile here, I'll go into more details on exactly what we've done inside the demo that I've created for this uh, webcast. Before we get into the threat profile, let's take a look at our scenario here. This is an extremely simple scenario so that we can easily understand our threat and characterize this easily to understand these IOCs. We have a command and control server outside the network. We have an inside target that has two command and control channels on, that has its own unique indicators. One of them is using an HTTP command and control channel running as a standard user. The other one uses SMB locally that operates a system. The reason this is done, and this is all part of your design when you're creating a threat profile, is you, just like I said, you maintain positive control and understanding of all of your actions. The intent of this is to have the user level command and control channel run over HTTP with the intent to look and feel like a standard user, typically to assist in bypassing authenticated web proxies, for example. Running as a regular user, it looks and feels normal. SMB traffic on the inside can also look and feel normal. This is run as a system level. In this case, this would allow the threat to maintain standard user level access to the system and locally privilege escalate as they need with this dual connected command and control channel. What does our threat profile look like this? This particular threat profile I call my mid-level, mid-tier threat. I use this more or less on every engagement that I work on as my starting point. It is the Goldilocks and Three Bears model. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. It fits very, very well. It's a good midpoint to start from. I can always tune this up and tune it down as needed. In this case, the threat for this scenario, it only exists to maintain command and control to support future attacks. This would be something that typically would be in a mid-tiered level command and control channel. It's there to maintain connection and access to the network. That's its goal. And in this case, from a blue team defensive measuring goal, it want this command and control is there to exist to determine if a blue can find if blue teams can find this. That's really its only goal. We're not looking at anything operational. Using this model here, I can turn this up and down. In this case, there is no exploitation. This is, occurs post exploitation, so the means to get this threat on system occur has already occurred or could be occurring if this was done for a real engagement. And that exploitation would be discovered in a prior phase, during the get in phase. Now we get into our command and control, which starts looking at our IOCs. In this case, we have two command and control channels, HTTP running a COBOL start beacon as a user, and an SMB beacon running, main, uh, running locally as system to maintain lateral, um, maintain privilege and support internal lateral movement. In addition, we have persistence techniques. This gets into the indicators that we're gonna be presenting to the blue team. We're doing user level persistence using a DLL hijack with this file named link info.dll. So this is, happens to do with a explore.exe DLL hijack uh, uh, persistence technique. And then we'll get into a WMI persistence technique. And this has a file, msupdate.exe. So in this case, we are putting files to disk. We are not doing anything in memory. And some of you might think, well, that's not interesting. That's not nice. Uh, the memory and PowerShell and all these extra things, the uh, 
what is very new and happening right now? And it is, but that's why I put this in that middle section because measuring a blue team's ability to defend against this can be very valuable. You understand what they can or cannot do. If this is extremely easy for them, then maybe you need to move to some other techniques. The techniques in here are not necessarily important. The important part is to design and build this out prior to your execution. All of this happens before you even get on a keyboard and start attacking a network. Let's look at some of these IOCs. These are all IOCs that we plan to use in our network. This will be much more clear in a moment when we actually show how you deploy these. So more detailed information about this. You're looking at HTTP traffic calling out every 60 seconds. So now we have a protocol, we've got a port, and we have a timing. So we're actually getting some network indicators in this mix. We know a file. We know we're replacing this file under C Windows Link Info. That DLL, customizing the timestamps, date, um, date, size, and MB hat, MB5 hash, common attributes that a blue team might discover and, and use in their investigations. And finally, we get into this metadata. Metadata is actually something I don't see red teams do often, and I want to put this in here specifically to show a technique that allows you to add some extra flavor and seasoning to your command and control into your malware that you use on an engagement. The SMB beacon is very similar. In the case, in this case, it's a msupdate.exe in the C Windows directory. We have specific network indicators as well. These were all designed and created as you go through this process. I'll show you how that looks in a second. In this case, we have a series of GET and POST requests that we're using that we've designed and created so that our malware has a certain look and feel to it. The SMB traffic is the same. Now, SMB traffic in this case are encrypted blobs of data that moves over the SMB protocol, but the SMB command and control channel is still its normal SMB um, protocol. In this case, what a, a threat would be leaving on the network is a named pipe called SVC SVC, as you see here in the bottom left. So let's actually get into the demo itself to really, really see what this looks like. Okay. So we're going to break down our threat profile in a little bit more detail to see some of these details. So we have our two beacons for our two different command and controls. As we saw before, this is using a malleable C2 profile. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that's specific to Cobalt Strike's ability to help us design and create threats and in certain characteristics of that malware. We're using DLL hijack for persistence. And in this case, this DLL hijack, just to expand on that, explorer.exe will call this link info.dll that normally does not exist in the normal paths. If I place a properly created DLL in the path, when explorer.exe runs, it will call link info.dll and therefore start my malware running under explorer.exe's context. It's a DLO hijacking is a common technique used during red teaming and even penetration testing. We have characteristics of our 60 second timing and we have this custom, bi metadata, uh, custom binary metadata. I will show that once I show you how I'm using this and building this, it'll make much more sense. Similar to the HTTP beacon, we have an SMB beacon and in this case, it has a custom name pipe, as you saw in the traffic that I showed earlier, is FDC, FDC. Again, it has custom date timestamps and met, uh, metadata. What would the blue team see on disk? This is something they would see if they ran a directory. You're looking at date timestamps, so this is a modified date timestamp on disk with an intent to blend in file size and file name. We get into the metadata piece. This is the information about the file. Just like if you would look at, say, an image file, and you can pull things such as GPS coordinates, you can pull any information about the camera, uh, these types of things, just extra information to give some context to that file. You can do the same on binaries in Windows, or really any file on there. And this will allow us to uh, make it look and feel more at home in that network. In this case, this particular scenario, we are attempting 
to take these two new binaries, msupdate.exe and linkinfo.dll, and make them look and feel like legitimate, real Microsoft files. That's the intent. We move into our persistence. Persistence is always important to the blue teams. It's very important for them to understand how and why the bad guy is staying in the network. In this case, we're using, like I said, we're using the uh, hijack. In addition, we're doing a WMI persistence. Now, this WMI persistence technique is not new. I first heard about this many years ago from Matt Graber, and it's not new, but it's still very valid, and it still very, fits very well in what I call my mid-tier threat. This is my everything is just right. It's a good starting point. There are techniques, and blue teams should be able to detect this. So having a threat that runs through these techniques on purpose gives blue team a really good practice round to see if their tools and techniques and work as it intended. So what this does, WMI will basically call a query that's looking for after the start time between 120 and 200 seconds, every 60 seconds, once it makes that, uh, once the system has been up for at least 120 seconds, it will call the, the malware that we named msupdate.exe. So every time you reboot the system, this will start, this will start our SMB persistence. So Explorer runs at login, we get a callback as a user level. After 120 seconds to 200 seconds, SMB beacon malware will execute. So within two minutes of a reboot, our system is persisted. That's the intent that we, we have. On disk, you'll see a new name type called SVC SVC as part of the SMB beacon. We get into our network indicators. I want to dig in these a little bit more than I should before, but all of these are things we've created as part of our threat profile design. In this case, to go along with our Microsoft binary metadata, we're looking at things, you'll see Windows Update, so you're doing a request to a Windows Update in the URL and have a host header or download windowsupdate.com. So what's happening is this is attempting to look and feel like Windows Update legitimate traffic. It's not, but that's part of the uh, intent. The server response, so the request comes back here. The response that you see here includes ASP.NET and Microsoft IS 8.5. Again, trying to look and feel like Microsoft assets. The post request is not much different. So once you're going through this, you've created all these designs, you've got to document and piece, put pieces together. Typically in an engagement, creating scenario setup steps actually is very well, is a good process to do this. Eventually, you're gonna place this on disk. Whether you're doing it through a staged event, such as an assumed breach model, or you actually use this on a real engagement, the operators that are on your team need to know how to deploy this command and control. You build out your team server, I wanna show a few pieces here. We're going to create a command and control server. We're going to generate our binaries and use this resource hacking tool to modify them. I will show that in a minute in more details. Eventually, what we're gonna move down to is once we have this ready to go, we create steps. How do you deploy this? These also are part of the indicators because they can leave traces back when these things go to disk. In this case, however your exploitation model calls for, like I said, in this case, this is assumed breach model, so we just place them on disk. But at the end of this, to do persistence, you only need to copy linkinfo.dll to the Windows directory. And then we're using PowerShell to do a time stop. In other words, change all the date timestamps, as you see here, to that system. Again, to blend in. So these are post exploitation steps that you would take. On the WMI persistence side for MS update, again, we're copying into the location we chose on disk. We, again, we do another time stomp. There's many ways of doing a time stomp. In this case, we're still using a single PowerShell command to modify that file so that it has the date timestamp that we chose. And then we're going to use an MS uh, WMI filter script. In this case, it's a PowerShell script that does what I mentioned earlier, which is run this WL query. And upon the running of that query, successful uh, running of that query, it will kick the msupdate.exe binary off. 
I'm not going to go into lots of details on that persistence mechanism. Um, it is documented very well, and there's a lot of information about it. Like I said, I like to put it into my mid-tier threat because it has been around for a while, and it's a good uh, persistence technique to test blue team's capability of defending. So let's look at this resource hacking to modify that resource. So what do I mean by metadata on a binary? So when I look in here, I see you see beacon.exe here. Beacon.exe was created through my PowerShell Cobalt Strike interface. And quickly, this is Cobalt Strike interface showing that I have command and control over this 192.168.15.100. It's calling back to me. And you can see it's calling back. Right now I've got it set for every six, uh, 10 seconds. The default was 60 as we created in our profile. But for the instance of uh, this demo in time, I wanted to have access to this so we don't have to wait a minute every single time. So within Cobalt Strike, once I create my command and control, I can come and create my executables that I need. So I can create my beacons here as my binaries. When I create those binaries, I will have something like this, beacon.exe. So that's my binary. This, this beacon.exe is called the generic binary that's ready to be deployed. If I ran this, double clicked it on a target system, it would give me a callback. If I use exit tool on Beacon, what you'll see is normal information you'd expect from a binary, file size, date timestamps, information like that. We don't see all this extra pieces where it shows Microsoft Corporation, version numbers, etc. Looking in here, you'll see notepad. I copied a valid notepad from a Windows box so I can show you what this looks like. It's going to be a source file for us. If I do exit tool on notepad, you will actually see all of this additional metadata. These are pieces that can be added to a file. They don't impact the file's execution. They just give it context on information on this. So now we see this is Microsoft Corporation. We see a version. We see lots of information about that. So what are we doing with this information? There's a tool called Resource Hacker, the Windows binary. Now, Resource Hacker.exe, I'm on a Linux system, so you'd say it's not going to run. In this case, I'm going to use Wine to run this. Now, why don't I just run this in Windows? Well, this platform that I'm using, this is my standard attack platform. This is a really important context to red teaming to have a good standard tool set. So my standard tool set exists here. If I can keep my tools to run in here, I will keep them. It helps with my workflow. So in this case, I've got a script called copy resources. And all this does is copies the resources from one binary to the other. It pulls all of the guts of the metadata out and puts them into another file. So let's run this. This is just merely a wrapper to the resources uh, resource hacker tool. I haven't released this script yet. There's nothing stopping me other than I just need to put a blog post out there and share it with the world. There's nothing magic about this tool. You can do all of this manually through resource hacker, but obviously uh, a quick script is much nicer. So in this case, I'm going to take Notepad and put the metadata into Beacon. Let it run its thing. It's going to do some stuff. And what I'm in, I end up with is a new file. So a date timestamp of the original file. Now if I exit this, I have all of the metadata. That process now just prepped that binary. I can rename this to such as msupdate.exe, and that is ready to be staged and placed on target in my environment. At this point in time, I would be ready for deploying and performing actions against the target network. Up to this point, I've done nothing on the target network. I'm just preparing and, re and prepping my threat profile so that I can create my look and feel how I want my threat to look. So what does this look like in Windows? This will be much more clear over here. So normal binaries in Windows, there's no path. If I look at the properties, you'll see date, time, stamps, et cetera, and then you have details here. And these details look exactly what you would expect. This is a Microsoft binary with all of this additional information. 
I copied a regular beacon. This beacon is not running, but this beacon.exe right here, if I look at the properties of this details, this is what it looks like. So if I did not edit metadata and positively control my IOCs to make it look and feel the way I want, I would have a generic binary that has no specific look and feel. May not be what I want, but then again, it might. That's why I say you positively control. There isn't really a right or wrong answer as to what you should do as long as you know what you're doing and maintain intent on why you did or you did not do something. So let's look at what we've done for this scenario. We have link info. So this is our HTTP user level beacon that is, runs when explorer.exe fires up. If I look at the properties here, you'll see metadata. We place this metadata. Now this has a look and feel of a Microsoft binary on disk. One thing to remember, and keep this question in mind, what is not shown here that, say, another real Microsoft binary would have? This is missing something. I'll talk about that in a moment. But just think about that as we go through this. Same thing on MS Update. It would have the same, similar modified metadata for this particular scenario. Still, the Microsoft copyrighted binary, here's the file description, versions, etc. All of the metadata has been completed and it looks and feels like a real binary, all through using a resource modification tool to make the binary look and feel the way we want before we place it on disk. So, from a defender's perspective, what is this going to look like? At this point in time, we've got malware running. We've got command and control executing over here. You see it calling back every 10 seconds or so. We have command and control over the target network. So from a defending side, what does this look like? And this is really important to see how tools and techniques of the blue team actually work. I'm going to use some system terminals tools for this. The tools I choose are not really important, but these are nice, quick ways of showing things. The actual tools that the blue team would use, there's so many out there that you're not really knowing which ones are, uh, they will be using. So this internals is a nice way to demonstrate a possibility of what the, this command and control, these IOCs would look like to them. So let's open up auto runs. And auto runs will show us all of the auto start locations. And oops, not properties of that one. Run as administrator. Okay. So auto runs, uh, maybe six months to a year ago, I don't remember the exact time, but it added WMI as one of the abilities to detect. So we actually now have a WMI tab here. We can look at WMI start points. So this tool added that capability to look for WMI events at startup. So when I open this up and it scans it, I get nothing. This actually occurred during the creation of this demo, and I really, really liked that it failed on me, because what it did was show me how blue team tools do not always work the way you think they would. So in this case, what was noticed when this was done is, if you look at the bottom, it says Windows entries hidden. Okay, what does that mean? Do options, uncheck hide Windows entries, and now we see what we've done. So what does that mean? That means this tool is using the publisher information of Microsoft Corporation to decide to hide or not hide anything. This tool is assuming that that binary is a Microsoft binary. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just understanding how that tool works. So modifying metadata directly had an impact to showing auto run to show what this looks like. Very interesting observation on this. And that's exactly what red teams and blue teams do working together. They can test and validate their tools and processes, respond and work the way expected. Let's move into another piece. So I mentioned earlier, keep a question in your mind about what binaries look like. Well, what if I do something called sig check? So this is going to check the signature to the, uh, of, the, of a file. And if I do a sig checker of notepad, I can type better, notepad, and it's going to take a little, and it's going to run longer than I want. 
I will show you this. Let's do SIG check. Let's start with our MS update. Okay, so when I look at MS update and I see this, you'll see all the metadata here, but you also see something called verified is unsigned. So that is, this binary is not signed. So this does not have a digital signature, signature to prove it really is Microsoft. All it's doing is claiming that it's Microsoft through some metadata. Often that's enough to trick individuals on looking at this. You'll see how that looks in a moment when we look at this in more detail. But if you look at, so linkinfo.dll is part of the, the Explorer hijack. If I look at all of the modules for signatures associated with explorer.exe, you'll see explorer.exe, verified sign, if I go through these real Windows files, you'll start to see they're signed. They're signed, signed, signed. But if I do a find of link info, link info here, I'm losing my mouse when I zoom in. There we go. So when you see this, another unsigned binary. So that's really the difference. So I don't have the ability, at least in the context that I built this command and control channel, to sign the binary, especially sign it from Microsoft. So I cannot do this, I can't sign that. Now, going forward, are there ways to sign this? Yes, there are. But part of my um, creating of this piece of malware that I'm placing on the target system, I'm choosing not to sign it. So I know that I'm leaving this indicator behind. It's not a bad thing. It's I'm doing it on purpose. So as long as a red team maintains and understands the IOCs they leave behind, they're not necessarily a good or bad thing. It's just part of the scenario. And that's what's really, really important. Control the scenario. Control the story that you're telling to the blue team. That's really what you want to do. So in addition to the, sig the signatures, we can look at the processes, what they look like running, actually running on the system itself. So let's open up Process Explorer. Oh, let me run it as administrator. So now Process Explorer here. I'll go down here and we'll talk about MS Update first. When you look at MS Update, what you see is here's MS Update. It's, if you follow the trace back, you'll see that it's part of services. When it, and it, is this a good or bad? Maybe, maybe not. That's not important right now. That's for blue teams. This is just what they see, how it looks and feels to them. So if I look at here and view, select other columns, and I select such as the version, and I add that, it still, still looks and feels like a regular Windows binary. It blends in very, very well. So it forces the blue team to step up their game a little bit and see if they can figure out why this is doing bad things. Additionally, as you look at this, because the link info is not running right directly in the process tree, you don't see it. So let's do a find on this. We know this is our bad link info, and we see that it's part of Explorer here, it's part of Explorer.exe. And Do a find again. And we'll see this again. This is showing it's a window, description of Windows Volume Tracking, Microsoft Corporation. It looks and feels like a real binary. So this forces, this will force the blue team to use other tools. Obviously, the system internal tools may not give them everything they want. They may need to dive into this much more. But on the surface level, this is the actions, and it's looking and feeling as we design this originally. We can also look, because we have an SMB pipe, I can run the pipe list tool and see that, yes, we do have an SMB name pipe for SBC, SCC. All of these techniques that I'm using right now can be done in a lab from a red team perspective to understand, to see if the design that they put together, that the red team created, matches what they see on the network. And so far, everything we're showing is matching and feels the way we intended. The way the blue team uses and does what they do with this, that happens during a real engagement to see how they actually respond. 
that's not as important right now. What's important is to control your look and feel through the manipulation and the management of IOCs. And finally, let's look over at some packet information so we can actually see did the design that we created during our threat analysis, our threat uh, profile creation, does it look and feel the way we want? Are the TCP IP indicators that, um, as expected? So let's just, I just picked a get request that we captured. What you'll see here is this is the same information that we designed. When we created our profile using malleable C2 profile modification in Cobalt Strike, we designed it to look and feel like this. Now we see on the wire, the blue teams would see this information. We've created the IOC. Now it's up to them to see what they do with it. But our IOCs are working as designed. And that bottom line, that's really what all of this comes down to, is maintaining control and understanding of what you're doing at any given moment. That's the process of managing your IOCs. You start with designing your threat, work through this, understand the intent of the threat, and work down to the actual indicators that you place. And like I said, it's really important to understand the indicators you place or you do not place. As long as you're in positive control of that, you're performing an appropriate red team engagement. With that, I want to move shift over and talk about the new red teaming course, SEC 564, Red Team Operations and Threat Emulation. This is a two-day course, so it's much easier to get to than some of the other courses. Um, but we take these two days and we jam-pack them with lots of good information. Day one, everything that I would call Red Teaming 101. During the creation of this course, my real intent was to, to take and if I had a new operator that would work with me, work on our, my team, that's what this is information is for. It's all of pieces and parts that you need to understand how to operate on a network, how to manage an engagement, how to build and create a red team, all the components. Day one is filled with this all of this. Day two shifts over to the execution side. We spend more than half a day in exercises walking through a full red team engagement, starting from the get-in phase we attack a network, moving into developing a threat profile to establish your command and control, maintain your IOCs, design those the way you would like them to look and feel, using that later on, holding on to that access, and using it later to actually cause an operational impact, in this case, in an ICS system. So we walk from the beginning to the end of an actual engagement. Now, I've been asked, where does this fit? Is this a management class? Is it is an operator keyboard class? And it really fits right there in that sweet spot in between. This is, in these two days, we put all of the core red teaming uh, concepts in these two days. This is what you really need to know to be a solid red team operator, whether you're managing it or you're working behind the keyboard. If you do not know this type of information, your red teaming capabilities and what you actually produce may not be as strong as you would like. We have several courses coming up this year. So go to the SANS website and you can look at that here or feel free to reach out to me directly if you'd like to know more about the course or any of the, uh, the dates that, that are coming. And with that, I will open it up to questions. All right, well thanks Joe for your great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Joe, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first question is, are there any IOCs on Linux or OS X in this course? This course, being two days long, focuses primarily on the Windows side. But with that said, many of the indicators that are created and done are generic, especially when you're talking about network indicators. Creating your command and control channels over SMB or HTTP, they would work on either Windows, Linux, OS X. They're more generic. So long term, as this course grows, we will have a lot more specific Linux IOCs and command and control channels that we focus on. But in the two days that we have, Windows uh, gives us the most that we need. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so is it better to start off as a blue teamer versus a red team? 
That's that's a tough one. Um, most people that I know who operate in the red teaming space came from either a system administration background or a developer background. Now, over the last, say, even five years, um, security is being offered in schools much more than it ever has been. So it's a new area that we're looking at. But what's important about red teaming, where it does help to be a blue teamer or, or even a sysadmin or a developer, is during your red team engagement, if you are the person behind the keyboard, the expectation of your knowledge across systems is really high. You might be working on the Windows box, shift over to a Solaris box, shift to custom web applications, shift to everything. Just as in penetration testing, you never know what you're facing, red teaming is the same, except this time, not only are you just doing exploitation, but you're manipulating and modifying to build new command and control channels. So probably even versus blue or red, having a solid technical foundation is the most important. Thanks. Uh, does, the, does the course cover the management of the exercise or just primarily the red team component? It definitely covers the management. The course runs, the course is laid out in the same format as a red team engagement from beginning to end. We start off with planning, we build this out, we look at creating your rules of engagement. All of the management components, so if you are a red team manager, red team lead, all of the pieces and parts that you need are very, very much covered in the course. Shifting to, on the other side, on the keyboard, all of the red team techniques that you need to understand how to build, control your IOCs, create and design command and control channels, all of those are done. And we do that all in two days. Like I said, it's a jam-packed two days that covers that entire, I'll call middle section. The extremes on both sides might not be there, but in those two days, we cover the core of everything you need as a solid red team operator. Does day one cover writing red team executive summary? Day one doesn't, but day two does. And that's because during the part process, uh, the course is laid out from start to end. The reporting is done at the end. So creating all of your reporting related artifacts are created, done at the end of day two to fit in the model of the course following a red team engagement from start to end. Thanks, Joe. Um, do you need to start out as a pen tester to be a red teamer, or can you start out, start out as a red teamer straight away? Similar to the first question, having a strong fundamental understanding of technology is really valuable. With that said, understanding penetration testing, I came from a penetration testing world, specifically application security penetration testing. That is the world that I came from. Um, those, that helps me tremendously when I'm doing red team operations. It really helps understand what you need to do. Penetration testing tools and techniques are very similar. They're just applied differently in a red team engagement. And that's really what you need to understand. So it goes back to having a strong technical foundation to understand how ports, protocols, operating systems, coding languages work. The more you understand on that, the better you will be. Thanks, Joe. Uh, what is purple team and what is the difference between purple team and penetration testing? So purple teaming is basically a mixing of the red and the blue. Think of uh, red teams and blue teams all coming together and running an engagement side by side. A red team operator will say, I'm launching this. I've established command and control. Blue team can turn and look at their user tools and techniques to see if they see it. And it's a direct communication back and forth between red and blue in real time to understand the threat and see what's happening. So instead of the red team does a bunch of work, and then they come back and said, hey, blue team, we did stuff. What did you see? This actually allows them to work in real time. Versus a penetration test? Well, a penetration test is just um, a security test designed to identify risk associated with exploitation. All right, well, that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you so much, Joe, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in.
For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.